Hi, everybody, and welcome to U.S. Farm Report. This week, my special guest is Earhart Finkston, who is the National Vice President of the National Farmers Organization. It's indeed always a pleasure to have Fink as a special guest on our show. We all are very much aware of the serious exodus of farmers from the farms of America. We are also very much aware of the fact that the youth from the farms of America are also leaving the farms and going to the urban areas. On this week's show, I'm going to visit with Earhart Finkston about some of these problems. And in fact, through his words, perhaps we can take a look into the crystal ball and glance at what perhaps will happen to agriculture in terms of these problems in the next five to 10 years. Think, how old really is the average American farmer? The average age now is between 57 and 58 years old. So I'd say it's very obvious that a good many of them cannot stay out there any longer or much longer for that very reason. So we are losing the farmers at a terrific rate. I think five years ago, we thought we were losing them at, at about the rate of 2,500 a, a week. And that is accelerating very, very fast. According to the President's Blue Ribbon Commission on Food and Fiber, we will be, because of low farm prices, down to 500,000 operators by 1980. And uh, half of that reduction to have been accomplished by 1975. Well, this would mean that five out of every six operators that we have out there now will be gone, or the number reduced to that extent. So I'd say we are facing a real problem that could very well de develop into a food shortage in this nation if this problem is not corrected and corrected immediately. 500,000 by 1980. Right. Now, that's compared to how many operators today? About three million. A very a very decided reduction, 85% to be eliminated by low farm prices. Now, I think in this nation, we've always taken food more or less for granted because there's always been plenty of it. But we're losing the producers, the young people, as you pointed out, cannot come in to agriculture. And this, I think, is in a way self-explanatory. First of all, if the established farmers can't stay out there, how can new ones come in and establish themselves? This is one aspect of it. And then the other is, of course, that the average income from the sale of all farm production across this nation now is 3% interest on the investment. So how can any young man enter agriculture and he'd have to enter with a debt, pay 8, 9, 10% interest for his investment and get a 3% return? I think simple arithmetic points out that it is an utter impossibility. So something's got to give, and something is going to give. I think on today's show, you will be meeting, along with our viewers, Elmer Burke Snyder of Uric, Missouri, and his two sons. Now, Elmer is a, a fairly substantial farmer. I think he farms some 550 acres. The two boys, upon graduation from school, went to town to go to work because they couldn't make it on the farm but they've returned now to the farm. One of them is renting land, the other one is helping his dad. Uh, does this happen very often? No, uh, not, not just that way. I've heard it said often times that uh, farmers can, or young fellows can establish themselves by taking over the father's operation. And see, this is of course assuming that you have a unit that is established, that is self-sufficient, that one boy takes that over. I think what they're overlooking when uh, we're talking on that vein is that the average family has at least four children and there isn't any father going to shut out, let's say, three other three children. Other no, right. he just isn't. So even if he does maybe take possession of that operation, there's still the debt factor is there. He's going to have to pay off the three brothers or sister and brother or whatever it may be. So it still comes back to just about the same thing, that unless he's an only child and his father is well fixed, and the only way he'd be that is if he made it years gone by when prices were good, and that'll defeat itself eventually too because they just cannot, it can't keep on that way. These young people going to the urban areas, 
can only result in their contributing greatly to the urban crisis. Oh, of course, uh, you already have great unemployment overpopulation in the metropolitan areas. We have directly from agriculture contributed in the last 20 years about 3 million families or about 5 million workers. In addition to that, we've destroyed through low farm prices many a businessman in the small towns, in the rural towns. So from the two sources, we've sent about 7 million workers out of agriculture or out of the rural community into the industrial center to compete for work there. So when you start tabulating all of these figures, then I'd say that probably the urban problem that we have, the unemployment, came directly from agriculture here. Now, very often we hear it said that the people in the ghettos and the people in the big cities that are not employed, the reason that they're not employed is because they're not skilled workers. Well, a farmer, believe me, is very definitely skilled when he's out there on the farm. He's skilled in many fields. But when he leaves that farm operation and moves into industry, he moves to the bottom of labor's totem pole, and he's an unskilled person there and is competing for exactly the same kind of jobs that the unemployed in our cities do not have. So I'd say even a great extent, to a great extent, that problem comes right out of rural America yeah. and low farm prices. I think the nation had better face up to it. They are going to be paced, paying through the nose for this food eventually, unless that they correct this situation now and pay those people who are producing it a fair price so that they can continue to produce for them. Or in short, they are destroying the goose that laid the golden egg for them. Think, why don't you join me and our viewers, and we'll take that trip right now to Uric, Missouri. We would like for all of you to meet Elmer Burke Snyder and his family, and another NFO member in the Uric area. I might mention to you that uh, it is still a uh, rainy season here in Bates County. In fact, uh, Elmer, I'm wondering if we'll ever get uh, our interview today finished without getting wet. You can perhaps hear thunder in the distance and uh, some sprinkles are falling. Well, what is the size of your farm here? We have uh, 600 acres. Now, what kind of farming uh, do you do? Is it pretty diversified? We have, uh, we have corn, soybeans, and some wheat, and grass, most of our side. Well, now, obviously, uh, you run hogs here, too. How many head a year do you figure you run, Elmer? Oh, we try to feed out around 250, 300 head a year. You're doing uh, some converting over here, I notice. Uh, you're converting um, what looks like a broiler house or a chicken house uh, to hogs. Would you like to tell me about that? Well, the boy, when he came back out of the city this spring, uh, he wanted to uh, go in the hog business, so I told him, well, he'd take that old chicken house and clean it out and go to work, and that's just what he did. And so he got put in farrowing crates, we put in concrete floor, and so he got all set up now for 10 sows. Well, that's fine. You know, uh, recently, U.S. Farm Report uh, covered the broiler situation down in uh, Cullman, Alabama. And uh, a lot of those broiler producers down there are pretty disgusted with uh, the way things have been going for them in terms of price are doing the same thing with their broiler houses. Price really is the name of the game, isn't it? That's mm. all that's a matter, the price. We, we found out how to raise it, but now we've got to get a price for it. Well, now, speaking of price, uh, your tenure with NFO has been, as you said, about 12 years. Uh, through the years, do you feel that NFO definitely has helped its members in the Bates County area price-wise? Oh, I think without a doubt mm. we've, we've got a, a big increase in the price, just through the efforts of NFO. I don't think nothing else. Uh, you are in a rather unique position, uh, Elmer. I don't know whether you're aware of this or not. One of the big problems, as our show this week is trying to point out with the agricultural scene, is that the young people are leaving the farm. Now, um, you have two sons who are still farming with you. Uh, but they did leave, didn't they? Yeah, they both had a hitch in the city. <laughs> Why did they go, Elmer? I just presume it just because we didn't think we was making enough on the farm, and they just had to had to go see for themselves what other farm or what other city people lived on and what they were doing. Well, now you mentioned a while ago that uh, in uh, your work with NFO, you were taken at one time to Washington, where you did talk to some of our national legislators, including uh, some of these people who represent urban areas. They're interested vitally in the farm problem too, aren't they? 
Oh, I think without a doubt, uh, we had very good talks with uh, these urban congressmen and senators, and they seemed like they were glad to talk to us. And uh, I think whenever you get uh, down to it, they really are wondering about our prices just as well as they are their own people. Well, in your case, uh, your two sons, uh, as you say, took a hitch in the city. Now, uh, you multiply that by thousands, and this is a contribution to what we're calling today the urban crisis. Uh, these fellows went to town and uh, became a part of that urban crisis. So these urban legislators, I think, have to be concerned with uh, the farm situation, hoping that uh, the farmers of America will get enough price to encourage the next generation and the one following to stay on the farm and maintain that family farm unit. Wouldn't you agree? I know a number of uh, boys uh, that would like to farm if they would have see a future in it and we get our prices like we should have. Uh, I think I see, think you'll see a trend of the younger boys back to farm. Speaking of prices, <clears throat> again, uh, when you and Miss Berg Snyder were married, and I think you told me this was 1936, uh, and this was pretty much Depression days, what kind of prices were you getting then for some of your farm commodities? Wheat, for example, do you recall? I think that uh, my share of my crop of wheat that time, and I think it sold for around 86 cents a bushel. Uh, what is it today? Oh, I don't know. I, I figured harvest would be around dollar twenty, maybe 25. And uh, what would you guess uh, has been the increase in production costs to the average farmer since 1936. <laughs> oh, I don't know. You're asking quite a bit there, but oh, it'd be yeah. tremendous. Wouldn't it, though? Yes, it would. Unbelievable, I'm quite sure. Yeah, that's right. Well, now, what do you figure is the real future in farming, Elmer? What, what do you think, uh, where do you think the future for your boys lies? Well, I can't help but think that there's a, uh, farming has a great future for anyone that wants to work, and that uh, you're going to have to do a little better job than the average because it's so competitive. But I think there's a good future in farming, and uh, I like to see my boys stay. Do you think that the future lies in, uh, in efficiency, or, or is it still a matter of price? I think the price is the biggest thing. Uh, that efficiency, it, uh, after you're on a farm a while, you kind of learn how to cut corners like yeah. that and be efficient. But I, you can't do any, not need to, no, there's no need to raise a lot if you don't get a price. That's just what amounts to. I don't think we're ever going to get it done, Elmer. I'm afraid not either. If we don't get soaked, we'll get hit by lightning. That's about right. Well, you mentioned uh, efficiency and price when you talk about the bright future of agriculture. Uh, I'd like your comments on how you feel price is going to best be achieved. Well, I think the one and only way is the farmers to unite and uh, join up with NFO and uh, hold, them, hold our production together to get a price. That's definitely uh, the answer. So many NFO members feel that really it's pretty basic and pretty simple, and I think you probably agree with that, don't you? Yeah. It, uh, I say it, always, maybe I shouldn't say this, but it's the simplest ridiculous. Yeah. Because, uh, and I still say that if the, all the farmers would uh, understand, they would join because we're not trying to do anything, only get them to block a production together and help one another to get a prize. You know, many people who are agricultural experts are looking uh, down the road a few years and predicting that because of the lack of price, uh, which is, of course, taking young people off the farms, that we perhaps in this country could have a very serious food problem. How do you feel about that, Elmer? Well, I, I don't know how, what to say about that. Uh, it stands to reason we could, because the average age of the farmers are getting old, and unless we attract some younger, younger ones back, uh, corporations or something like that would have to take over. And I just don't feel like they could produce it as uh, cheaply as as good as a family type farm. Elmer, I want to thank you, and uh, before we get any wetter, I think I'll uh, leave you, if you don't mind, to uh, talk for a few minutes with your sons, uh, William and Jean, and I do hope that they're in a drier place than you are, okay? Okay. okay. Hi, fellas. Hello, Bill. Hi, Bill. Hey, how you doing? Pretty good. 
You think we're going to get wet? <laughs> Possibilities. <laughs> Probably. Well, you know, uh, the way we're able to cut film, I'm sure our audience uh, is wondering how I can take, take five steps and move from rain to no rain. But that's what we've done, and I like it better where you are than I did with your dad. <laughs> it's better. We won't melt that That's way. right. Hey, uh, Bill, uh, are you the older of uh, this Susan? Yes, sir. And uh, you're farming nearby, aren't you? Yeah, about six miles away. From here. How many acres are you farming? Oh, 350, 400 acres. What, uh, what kind of farming are you doing? Is it pretty diversified? A general farming, corn, yeah. beans, livestock. Did you invest in land over there? Or no, or? Um, it's all rented. All rented yeah. land. Now, what about you, Gene? Uh, are you farming on your own? Yes, I'm helping Dad this year and hope maybe I'll be able to rent some acres next year. Yeah. Now, you know, we've talked, your dad and I, about you two. Uh, you really uh, aren't fitting the pattern, you know, in agriculture today. The pattern being that uh, young fellows like yourselves who grow up on the family-type farm, uh, they're leaving the farms and they're going to the urban areas and working and uh, staying there. Now, as I understand it, from your dad, both of you gave that a try, <laughs> but it didn't work out. What uh, what made you go to town to work, Bill? Oh, try to make a little money in the wintertime, but as soon as that old warm day got here, well, I got my paycheck and come home. Yeah, where did you go? Oh, I worked in the wholesale, uh, Associated Wholesale Grocers over in Kansas one winter and Hallmark Cards one winter. Yeah. That's Last time I've been up there. Well, what you're saying is that uh, you couldn't make it on the farm, so you thought maybe that's where you could make it in in town, right? Well, grass looked greener on the other side of the fence. It yeah. wasn't as green as it looked like. It does <laughs> that, doesn't it? Uh, it sure does. What were your reasons, Gene? I uh, just tried it out. Heard a little bit about it and tried it out. And I'd done spent my apprenticeship up there, so I thought I'd come back. Yeah, you went to where? Uh, all different kinds of construction. And the uh, biggest part of it I worked up there was a gas service company. And uh, bartended quite a little bit. Yeah. How long did you work in uh, Kansas City? Uh, anywhere from three to four years, off yeah. and on. Yeah. Well, did the uh, grass uh, a little do a little fading on you, too? <laughs> yeah, it turned a little bit greener on the other side, yeah. one side is up there. Well, you know, this is what you guys know, farming. Uh, after all, you grew up on this farm, and... Uh, so I can see where it might be a little difficult to get the, the farm out of the farmer. And it certainly is uh, that in your cases. What about some of the guys around here with whom you fellas grew up and went to school on neighboring farms? What are they doing, Bill? Oh, they're scattered all over. I think I'm about the only one out of my class that's farming now. Of course, there's a few in neighboring towns. It's just very few is farming, though. Yeah. They try, and then they'll try something else, and then they come back and go back. but. Oh, I don't know. It looks like you're going to stick with the city now. You know, it's kind of a sad commentary, I think, on agriculture that people like you and Gene, who really want to farm, so often have to take jobs to make enough money to farm, <laughs> you know? It's and it's the truth. It happens, doesn't it? It's right. What about uh, some of the fellows you went to school with, Gene? Are they scattered, too, like Bill's friend? Uh, not near as bad, uh, a little bit younger, and uh, a lot of them's in service now. If they come back, they will probably go to the city. Well, Bill and Gene, you fellas grew up on an NFO farm with a father who's been an active NFO member. You've both tried it in the urban areas. You don't like the urban living. You're back to farming. You went because... Uh, you couldn't make a living, you fell on the farm. So coming back, you must, both of you must have some hope for farming. Bill, where does, where does the hope lie? A lot of it being increase in prices. We've got the production if we can just get some prices for it now. You agree with that, Gene? I certainly do. I really do. We need uh, prices about as much as anything. It needs to go up, and like you said, we've got plenty of production. Well, you know, you're farming efficiently, I'm sure of that, from what we've seen around here. Most farmers today are farming efficiently. Uh, most farmers are increasing their production tremendously. But along with that, of course, comes greatly increased production costs, and I expect that you've all been experiencing that, haven't you, Bill? Sure have. Well, fellas, where do you think this price help is going to come from? Bill? It'll be through collective bargaining 
through NFO blocking our production together and selling together. It's about the only way we're going to achieve this thing. Gene? I uh, feel about the same way the farmers in the community are all over nationwide going to have to stick together, similar to the unions of Kansas City or that I've been related to. One man walks off the job while the rest of the men follow him. It's pretty hard to accomplish it in farming anymore by going it alone, isn't it? It can't be done because you're just not big enough. Yeah. How many uh, children do you have, Bill? I've got two, a little boy and a little girl. Oh, great, and you're a bachelor, aren't you, Jim? Yes. You going to do guess. something about that? I'm uh, looking that way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> fellas, thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure visiting with you today. Thank, thank you, Bill. Bill. You bet. Now I'm going to run over here and talk to a neighbor of yours, uh, Lee Ernie Dahl, okay? Okay, Bill. You know, uh, I'm told by the people around these parts that uh, not too many years ago, as far as NFO goes, you were pretty much of a skeptic. Is that right? This is correct. How did you feel about it 10, 11 years ago? I thought it was out of this world. I thought they were dreaming. Uh huh. So I was against it for about two years, and I began to listen a little more. Every time they come around and talk to me, I began to realize they had some truth to go on. So I was thought a little more, listened a little more, and I joined 10 years ago. Well, now, has your neighbor, uh, Elmer, uh, had much to do in influencing you? Well, Elmer and uh, several of the boys yeah. around that belongs to yeah. him. I've had about 10 different guys at that time had talked to me. Where I was you... one of those blockheads, I want to <laughs> say. <laughs> Where do you farm, uh, Leon? I farm south of Uric, Missouri. How many acres do you farm? Approximately there? 400 acres. Yeah. What, uh, what is it, grain farming, basically? Well, it's diversified. I have yeah. black Angus cattle, and I feed my calves out, and I have Yorkshire hogs, and I feed out hogs. Right. I feed all the grain that are raised, practically, except soybeans. Well, soybeans. Now, you, like uh, Elmer, have been a hard worker with NFO. You've uh, certainly done your part in organization here in Bates County. Uh, what all have you accomplished for the organization? Well, that would take a lot of time if I wanted to tell it all, but I would like to correct you. I live in Henry County, which oh, is close. Oh, yeah, it's close by, isn't by it? Here. Right. But uh, uh, I've worked in several different fields, help organizing, help talking to farmers, and I've been on the grain committee. I'm zone grain chairman now. I've been vice president five years in my county. I've done some legislative work. I've gone to Jefferson City and to Washington, D.C., and uh, went to the governor's conference two different times mm -hmm. since they've started them, which they are very interesting. It takes a while for the farmers to get their story across to these people, but I think we are gaining in this respect. Well, in your county, Lee Ernie, as well as in Bates County, I presume that you have watched this exodus from the farms of this part of Missouri on the part of the young people. Uh, you have watched these boys here on this farm, I suppose, grow up and leave, and they've come back. Uh, one of the reasons they have told us that uh, they have come back to farming is that through NFO they see a little bit of a bright glimmer of hope for better prices. Do you agree with that? I agree with this 100%. NFO is the only answer for the future of the American farmer. If we don't have collective bargaining for farmers, it will go corporation. Mm -hmm. And corporation is not good for our country. Well, corporation farming uh, is not doing too well, is it, Lee Ernie? It's not doing a bit of good now, and it won't until it gets control. And then they will raise food prices to make a profit at yeah. this time. Now, you don't have any sons to worry about in terms of leaving, do you? No, I have two girls, but one of them is married at the Pleasant, and the boy is from a farm and would like to return to the farm, mm -hmm. but he is going to U.S. trade school on diesel at this time. Well, do you know of any specific experiences where a fella, a young man off of a farm in your county has gone to the city and what has happened to him? Well, there's been several to go. I can mention my brother if this is sufficient. He had a, a boy that was coming right out of high school and he would like to farm in every respect but he could not put the money together to start agriculture so he went to Kansas City and through an uncle got on as electrician helper and joined the union which they sent him to college or to night school he has got his German card now and drawn a good salary and this boy will never be back to the farm so how are you going to keep him down on the farm price and only price That's if it. there is money in agriculture equal to the rest of the economy they will stay on the land Sometimes a lack of understanding can be very detrimental to an organization, and I would presume that perhaps through your county and this part of Missouri,
the non-NFO members perhaps are non-NFO members because they really don't understand NFO and haven't been informed properly about NFO. Would you agree to that? I would agree with this 100%. Now, of course, you know, you're, you're living proof that this can be so because you admitted that uh, before you joined 10 years ago that you were pretty skeptical and pretty much against NFO, and the reason that you felt that way was because you didn't quite understand and didn't have the full picture. How does a farmer get the full picture? Well, there's several ways, but I would suggest one way of an open invitation to come to our county meetings, talk with our county officers with questions, ask them any question about the organization that you are interested in. We are a group of farmers trying to bargain for our products and yours to put a price on these products the same as the rest of the economy does with their products. And if you will come and ask your questions, I think then you will understand what we are trying to do. You know, I've been to many an NFO meeting, and if these meetings are anything, they're open, above board, and completely honest. And uh, I think that probably a meeting of the nature you are talking about could be a source of great information. This is true. I've been to a lot of different meetings, and if there's any question comes up, it is usually settled before we ever move on to another one. Open-mindedly, discussions, and let you make up your own mind of what you want to do. But if you would understand this, collective bargaining is nothing but block your production together, selling together, and putting a price tag on it. Think, does a farming operation the size and scope of Elmer Burke Snyder's represent American agriculture at its most efficient? That's the very heart of agriculture. The family type unit, the most efficient in the world. Anybody that's ever, any nation's gotten away from it got into a very serious situation. Think I want to thank you very much for being my guest today. My pleasure. It's always my pleasure. My special guest on this week's U.S. Farm Report, Mr. Earhart Finkston, National Vice President of the National Farmers Organization. U.S. Farm Report is seen each week at this time on this station. Until we meet again, so long, everybody. Mm -hmm.